Good morning. Welcome to XP Days 2017. Uh, it's good to see everyone here, and I'm just impressed by the level of uh, the quality of the facilities that Mikolai and that have put on. It's been really nice. Um, so I drew the short straw. I've got the first speaker slot after the keynote, which happened to be a really good keynote as well, so it makes it even more difficult. Uh, I think Venkat spoke to a lot of stuff that you know, I've felt over the last sort of 10, 15 years. Uh, and it still surprises me that there's just people in the industry that aren't doing the stuff that he's talking about. Um, one of the other things about drawing the first speaker slot is that last night they were good enough to take us out to dinner to a local bar, Varvara Bar I think it is, uh, craft beers, all that sort of good stuff. But being in the first speaker slot, I could only allow myself two beers. So I missed out on all those other craft beers, but I'm definitely going to try and get back to eat some more of them. Um, does anyone here think I should be talking about microservices this morning? Oh, well, you're in the wrong room. <laughs> no. Um, so this talk is going to be about ports and adapters architecture uh, and talking, uh, thinking about the inside and the outside of an application. Uh, what we're going to focus on today uh, isn't so much the ports and adapters wiki page that Alistair Coburn's got, because I'm pretty sure most of us have read that or are capable of going and reading it. So I will give a brief introduction about ports and adapters. But mainly what I'm going to take you through is a case study uh, at CoolBlue of how we took uh, an application that was having a lot of problems and we applied ports and adapters uh, architecture to it and we ended up with a really good solution that enabled us to achieve that level of testability that Venkat was talking about. Uh, in his keynote. Just before we get started, um, can I just do a quick survey on the room? So who here, like myself, uh, is a .NET programmer? C Sharp. Yeah, great, great. I've been to other conferences where it's all Python and that sort of stuff. Who, who's doing Python here? Python in production, anyone? Nice, nice. Uh, and who are the people here that love to play with razor blades in production? Who's doing JavaScript in production? Yeah. Oof. Yeah. <laughs> Any Ruby in production? No? Wow. I mean, I did say production, so maybe they, they just don't go hand in hand, maybe. Um, so you probably also, uh, this gives you a chance to adjust to my accent as well. Um, sometimes it can be a little bit difficult to understand what I'm saying. <laughs> um, so a little bit about me. Who am I? Uh, I'm Nathan Johnson. I work at Cool Blue in the Netherlands as a technical pathfinder. Uh, technical Pathfinder is an interesting job title. Uh, it basically allows us to do all of the good stuff that principal developers and senior developers do, but not have to have the role of architect or the name, the word architect in our title. So basically, we get to do a lot of software architecture, but I probably spend about 60 to 70% of my time in the teams, helping them with stories off the backlog, helping them do architectural reviews, and helping them plan for the future. Uh, so I'm from New Zealand. Uh, I started off life uh, leaving high school. I didn't go to university. I left high school to become an electrician. So I trained as an uh, industrial electrician. Uh, and then I switched into software development. So I've been a professional software developer for about the last 17 years. Now, I say professional software developer there because I've always been a software developer at heart. My first computer was a Commodore 16. Uh, I got it when I was about eight or nine. I, I can't really remember the exact day and time I got it, but you know, I got this beautiful machine, a Commodore 16, when I was young. And it came with a tape drive. Like, not a, not, no floppy disks back then, it was a tape drive. And it had one game. And you know, I was lucky if that game would load 50% of the time. So very quickly, I went through the books that I got with my Commodore 16, and I discovered this basic programming manual. I was like, aha, what's this? So I sat down and I wrote my first program. I'm sure there's going to be a lot of people here that can identify with this. But this was my first program. It was 10, because we always start with the number 10, even though you can start with the number 1 in basic. You start with 10. And it was print. Nathan is awesome. 20. Go to 10. Run. And from that point on, I was hooked. I knew it was what I wanted to be, software developer. Uh, I'm living in the Netherlands at the moment, uh, enjoying the Dutch culture. Me and my wife decided to move from New Zealand uh, a couple of years ago. We've been there almost two years now, so I didn't fly all the way from New Zealand uh, here. And you know, the Dutch are nice people, it's really good, but one of the things of getting out of your own country and only being used to speaking with other New Zealand Kiwi natives is I found it very quickly that people do mistake some of my words sometimes with my accent. Uh, so the Kiwi accent is a little bit hard to understand, but basically, if you can imagine the vowels, you've got A, E, I, O, U. If you drop out the O, 
and just get rid of that completely. Any word you think that you hear me say with a U is probably actually an I. Any word that you think me hear, you heard me say with an I is probably an E, and the E is probably an A. So let's give that a test, right? So when my washing is finished at home, I take it out and I hang it on the line with pegs. Anyone hear that? Those are pigs, not pigs. Right, I think we should be good to talk now. So the starting point for this talk. Uh, at Cool Blue, about a year ago, I was asked to join a team and help them with their application. It was having a lot of problems in production. Um, it was getting taken out of production for various bugs and issues they were having. And there was just a lot of grief and there was some very unhappy developers there. So I joined the team uh, to look at the stock purchasing application. Now, the team's domain dealt with stock purchasing. So within an e-commerce company, that is, the, that is the job of making sure the warehouses are always with, have the right number of stock for different products. So this application consisted of uh, a listener that would get messages to order stock, and it would then send off an EDI message to our external um, vendors, our suppliers, and then they would send us stock. So that, that's the domain we're dealing with, a stock purchasing application. Now, when you join a team, there's lots of, there's lots of things that need to go on when a developer joins a team. Uh, a lot of it's like the soft skills stuff, which is really, really important. But as a developer joining a team, one of the most important things you can do is get up to speed quickly with your new domain, if you're switching domains, and with the technology and the implementation that is in front of you. One of the things that can help you do this isn't just reading the code, it's taking the team's diagrams, architectural diagrams of their system, and looking at them. Because one of the things that you know, Agile certainly never said, but some people seem to think it says, is no documentation. It says documentation at the right time. So this team was really good. They actually had an architectural document, which was easy to maintain because it's a relatively simple system. Uh, and I was able to dive into that and just see what their dependencies were, which bits of infrastructure they depended on. So I've simplified the diagram down here a bit. Um, the, the main three pieces of infrastructure they depended on was RabbitMQ, uh, Oracle, and RavenDB. The applications that we had for this domain was we had your typical web API, uh, and this just consisted of you know, some endpoints that uh, various clients would hit. Uh, the web API depended on RabbitMQ, it depended on Oracle, and it depended on Raven. The next application we had was a messaging service. Uh, the messaging service depended on RabbitMQ, depended on Oracle, and depended on Raven, for different reasons. And the last piece of the puzzle was we had a scheduler. And that was just for kicking off timed batch jobs. Uh, you know, there were some things that tidied up things in the database that ran once a night and various hourly jobs that would get triggered. Now, this application also had some assemblies within it. Uh, it had a data access assembly, it had a domain assembly, and it had a common assembly. The data access assembly, as you might well guess, was concerned with data access. The domain assembly was where the business logic was supposed to be because it's the domain. I say supposed to, but we'll get to that. Uh, and the common was your typical bag of all tricks where developers can't think of where to put something. So there was string functions, there was logging, there was other, other common stuff. Now, the application also had dependencies between these assemblies, of course. Uh, the first one was the messaging service, pretty much depended on everything. Yep, the next one, the web API, again, it depended on everything. Can anyone guess what the third one does? It also depends on everything. <laughs> now, this isn't inherently bad. Uh, at least they're all pointing in the right direction, right? They're all pointing down. There's no godforsaken like, reference between the scheduler to the web API for some reason. And maybe someone was trying to be dry or something. But at least they're all going in the right direction. Now, moving to the next layer down, let's see if there's any dependencies between the class libraries. So there was a dependency from data access to common. Again, bag of tricks. It was doing some logging and some other various sort of cross-cutting concerns. The next one was interesting, though. There was a dependency from the domain back to the data access library. Hmm. Now, hopefully people's spidey senses are tingling. Uh, it just depends where you are in the whole life cycle of software architecture. Because we've actually seen this diagram before lots of times. It can be drawn as this guy, end here. Good old layered applications. Yep things that PowerPoint architects love, because I mean, this is so easy to draw, the lines are nice and straight, and it just really speaks to our sort of human need for tidiness, right? Also, isn't something missing? Didn't I say there was a rabbit in there somewhere? A rabbit MQ? Well, it turns out all the rabbit MQ stuff was in the data access assembly, because that made sense. 
it's just data access, or at least that was the way the team thought about it. So, pain. Some of the reasons that it was failing in production. So, the problem with this application was, oh, there was, there was a quite a few problems, but just near pointing out the top three. The top three. So because all of the infrastructure was in one assembly, because it's layered architecture and that's what you do at the bottom, you have your data access, uh, it meant that there was a lot of sharing going on. Uh, and I mean, two, of, two opposing forces in software are duplication and dependencies. So if you try to remove duplication by being dry, then you end up coupling to a lot of things. Uh, if you want to reduce your coupling, it necessarily means you need to duplicate. Unfortunately, this team valued dry on everything, which meant inside their infrastructure assembly, they had a lot of classes being reused when they shouldn't be reused. Uh, the next problem was testing. And this is a strange problem to have because this application had 90 to 95% test coverage, and yet it would still fail in production. It's like, how can that happen? Like, it's got test coverage, 95%. And I mean, these weren't the brittle UI tests that when Kat was talking about. I mean, you know, this is test coverage. It's, it's not the ones where it takes an hour to run. So going back to the, one of the other problems was the leakage problem. So the problem with leakage. Now, if you look at, remember that reference diagram? We had the domain assembly pointing to the data access. Now, if your references are going that way, it means that in the domain, you can use whatever type is publicly available in the data access class. So you end up with types leaking back into the domain that shouldn't be there. And then there was the dry problem, the reuse, reuse, reuse problem, as I like to call it. So, I mean, dry is a good software principle, but it's one of those things like, unless you really, really understand what the intent of it is, it can really get you into a very sore place very quickly. The, the, the main thing with dry is to remember it's really about being dry within a boundary, not dry across your whole application. And, you know, this ports and adapters, this can help fix a lot of this stuff. Let's go into their test coverage for a minute. So I said 90 to 95% test coverage, and yet it would still fail in production. So let's just have a look at what those tests were composed of. Hey, it's a test pyramid. Cat stole that from me. <laughs> um, so they had unit tests. Right, unit tests, awesome, great, good to see. And that was it. Just unit tests, 95% unit test coverage. So is there anyone here that thinks you can build any kind of relatively complex application with just unit tests? Oh, Terry. <laughs> um, no. No, you need all sorts of tests. Uh, any, kind, any of your hard problems, race conditions, you know, that sort of stuff is always going to be in between the boundaries of your tests, uh, of your classes. So you also need component tests, you need integration tests, and you need acceptance tests. So the first thing we decided to try and tackle uh, when I joined the team was let's try and get some integration tests in place. Now, integration tests are one of those interesting things that there's a lot of different definitions of them. Um, some people would think a unit test is one class. Uh, that's not my school of thought, but we can go into that later at the speaker's corner if anyone wants to catch up with me. Um, so the integration test we were trying to implement was we just wanted to implement basically from the web service. We wanted to be able to spin the web service up in memory, which with .NET you can do quite easily with Owen or the newer sort of .NET core stuff. We wanted to test all of our middleware, we wanted to test our endpoints and our domain, and then we wanted to have some mocks in place for our you know, hard dependencies like our databases and network calls and that sort of stuff. Now, this was very, very difficult to do because when you're doing integration tests, one of the things you really want to do is you want to use the same code that builds your object hierarchy in production for your tests. You don't want to duplicate the assembly of your classes. You don't want to duplicate how your container is doing its registrations. You want to use the same code that you're using in production to build your SUT for your integration tests. The trick is you need to allow yourself some test seams to get in there and actually be able to replace some of your hard dependencies like your databases. So we dived in and we found that was really hard with their existing implementation. So we sort of thought, well, okay, let's back off uh, and let's see if we can get some changes in the code to make it easier to test. And this sort of lines up with Venkat's keynote there about you know, doing the automation testing and getting the most amount of coverage without going through UI. So one of the reasons why it was hard again was the interfaces were co-located with the implementation. So what does this mean? Well, we had that reference from domain to data access. So let's dive into it and let's see what one of the examples was. 
Um, in the domain, we have a purchase order submission service, which was responsible for submitting purchase orders to the suppliers. Uh, it had a reference to an interface, uh, an I purchase order retriever. Interface was in the data access assembly. Does anyone see any problems with this yet? Uh -huh. Good, good. Uh, the implementation was also in there. Uh, nice and cozy there together. Yep. Now, there are some problems with this. Who owns the interface? And this is, this is something I see every, like not every time, but I see a lot of it. Pe people, when they're designing projects, um, designing solutions, they automatically put the interface with the implementation, and that's wrong. The person who owns the interface is the, is the, con is the consumer, the domain. It's basically saying, hey, I want you to implement something that fills this contract. And then you can have multiple implementations all over the place if you want. We take the example of a laptop here. If we look at the laptop and we consider the laptop, the inside of the laptop, to be the application, if we consider the thing plugging in the side there, uh, it could be you know it could be a camera, it could be a mouse, it could be anything. That's the adapter in terms of ports and adapter. It becomes pretty obvious who owns the port, right? The laptop owns the port. It's not each adapter owning the port. Each adapter plugs into the port. And this is uh, something you need to remember with your interfaces as well, as it's the consumer that owns them. So some of the problems you get with co-location when your interfaces are in the same assembly as your implementations. If we have this reference, and in our domain, we had some really rich domain objects. We were sort of moving into the DDD sort of area. We had a ubiquitous language. We had conversations with our stakeholders. We had a purchase order, which had some really nice, uh, you know, submit, approve. The business logic was starting to be very, very obvious. You didn't have to go and look through 50 different classes to find it. You know, submitting and approving were pretty obvious. They were in the purchase order. But what it means is I can't do that. My interface for talking to a purchase order retriever in the signatures for getting a purchase order, it cannot return me a purchase order because that would be a circular reference. So what does it have to return me? Well, we've got this other class called a purchase order document, and that's what we use to store it in Raven. So why don't we return that to the domain and let it have one of those as well? So now we have our representation as to how we store it in Raven also being returned into our domain. And it had to be public because we needed to do the mapping in the domain back to a purchase order. You know, once, once that sort of stuff starts becoming public, uh, and you get new developers joining team, you get people changing, you know, you get the, the tribal hand down of knowledge between developers. It's pretty easy for things, the boundaries to start shifting and things happening in the domain that shouldn't be happening in the domain. What we really want to um, highlight there is that the purchase order submit service had access to the purchase order document and bad things started to happen. The purchase order document at one point suddenly found its way out of the domain on the, on, the, uh, on the message queue as a message because someone thought, hey, it looks the same, I'm just going to use the document type there. Hmm. Now, what this also does is if I have the domain referencing another assembly and it's referencing the interfaces, but if it's also referencing a bunch of types that belong in the implementation, so the purchase order document was for Raven. That was its only reason for existing. It was a Raven implementation. But now my domain knows about it. So if I want to pick up my domain and drop it into another application, let's say I wanted to write a, cons a command line application that allowed me to do certain business processes from the command line. Maybe I want to hook it up to a task scheduler and kick it off uh, to approve purchase orders at some time of night. I, I can't really do that anymore. If I want to change my database, I can't do that anymore because every time I shift the domain, the purchase order document comes along for the ride. And the purchase order document was only the Raven representation of what we wanted to save. So we lose that isolation violation. We can, we can no longer pick up our business logic and implement it in whatever we want to. Now, one of the culprits for this, I think, going back to the entire layered sort of architecture, is the arrows. Every time you see these diagrams, they're drawn like that. And we look at the arrows and we think, yeah, that makes sense. Yep. There are definitely arrows showing references. That's, that's who references who, right? No. No, it's not. The way to think about it is that is control flow, that's execution flow. And what control flow and execution flow means is that's showing that most of the execution points start at the presentation layer. And again, uh, some, of the, some of the diagramming and some of the terminology around this, when you say presentation layer, it doesn't necessarily mean UI. It just means where the logic is presented, like it could be a, you know, it could be a command line application, it could be a you know, web API, it could be anything. That's your presentation layer. So the logic generally starts there. You'll receive a web service call. You'll go through whatever middleware you've got. You'll unpack your DTO or your model or whatever you want to call it. And then your execution will dive into your business logic. It'll go through your business logic, and it will call out your business logic sometimes into a data access layer. 
then it'll do some data access stuff. It'll maybe get some stuff or persist some stuff. It'll come back into your domain. They never show that on there. And then it'll go back out again into another data access layer thing. But that's what those arrows really mean. They're actually meant to represent the, the um, direction of control. If we flick that, flip that around and we actually draw in the reference direction, then this is what the diagram should look like. The references should be pointing that way. For the references to point that way, it means that the interfaces have to live in the business logic layer. And this is where we get to our brief introduction about ports and adapters. So this is a diagram straight off Alistair Coburn's page. Um, and you know what the, the best, the, he sums up ports and adapters in the first paragraph, really. Uh, I mean, that sentence there really says it all. What you're striving to do is you're striving to build an application core. You can call it domain. You can call it your business logic layer. Call it whatever. But you're trying to build this core at any point in time you can have different things driving it, which means different things forcing the execution of con uh, control flow. And you can test it in isolation from its runtime dependencies. You can change an adapter for an in-memory dictionary. And this is something we do quite a lot. Is instead, you know, when we're starting off a project now, the first adapter we write is just an in-memory dictionary for the persistence layer to get going. Another thing you might have also heard it called is hexagonal architecture. Um, and I think it's maybe 50-50 as to what people call it. I generally myself prefer to stick to ports and adapters because I think it's clearer and it's easier in everyone's mind to sort of understand because we deal with ports and adapters in our everyday life. We plug things into HDMI, you know, we plug TVs in here, things into USB cables, um, that sort of stuff. The hexagonal architecture came around because Alistair really wanted to shift people from thinking in terms of layers into thinking in terms of inside and outside. And a hexagon, you know, there is no layers in a hexagon, there's edges. And the hexagon isn't actually special. Uh, he mentions this on his, um, on his web page. The only reason he chose the hexagon was the inside-outside thinking. The six, in terms of the six sides, doesn't actually mean anything. You can use whatever symbol you want. You can use a pentagram or a dodecahedron or something like that. But it's just mainly to show that you know, your application needs symmetry inside and outside. The other diagram he's got on his website is a more detailed one there, which basically sh gives you an idea about where the ports come into play. So he's got the application in the middle there. Uh, he's got a notification port uh, as one edge. He's got a database as the other edge. He's got an administration port, and he's also got a trigger data port. Now, with the ports and adapters, you can quite often look into a ports and adapters implementation, and the actual ports don't actually exist. They're just an abstract concept. There is nothing inside a .NET project, or at least the way we implement it, that will actually be a port. There's nothing compilable that's a port. At best, it's a namespace where all the interfaces are. Uh, the adapters, on the other hand, they generally end up being your assemblies, or packages in Java, or whatever other construct your language has. So in .NET, we tend to implement our ports as interfaces, uh, sometimes as abstract classes, but mainly interfaces. Um, you know, not, there's not really much common implementation detail there to use an ab abstract class. And on to what we actually did. So again, I just w wanted to just briefly cover that because there's lots of really good information that I don't want to rehash uh, out on the web. And let's get into how we actually moved our application to ports and adapters. So the first port we chose uh, was persistence because that's, that's a pretty easy one. Uh, everyone's used to dealing with databases um, and data access and that sort of stuff. So we'll put the references back in, get rid of the common because we're just going to leave that. It is okay to have a common assembly, you know, cross-cutting concerns like logging and stuff. It's not really worth trying to do an adapter for that. So we've got the references there, and we put a persistence adapter in, and then through the magic of being a PowerPoint enterprise architect, I can just say we're done because it's a box and it's got arrows. But I don't want to take anything away from the team that did the work here. I mean, this, was, this wasn't easy. This wasn't just drawing a box and changing some arrows, right? I mean, we want the references to point the right way, but we've got implementations in the data access assembly, and we've got the domain referencing things from the data access assembly. So we can't just move code and then have the uh, references point a different way. We actually used a technique uh, called the Mikado method. Um, and on the next slide, I actually find now, I've mentioned this quite a few times in a number of different talks, and I actually have to show how it's spelt because of my accent again. I've had people unable to Google it, and I've been going, what have you been searching for? And they've gone, ah, oh, M-E-R-C-A-R-D-O. What? Where did you get the R from? Mercado. And there's, no o, there's no R in there, at least the way I hear myself say it, there's no R. Um, so 
the lifting and shifting here was actually quite complicated, and it took you know it took quite a while. But the reason I like the Mikado method is you get away from this like talking to your sort of scrum master and your PO saying, ah, oh, can we have the next three sprints to do this you know technical debt thing? We've got to implement this persistence adapter, and we're not going to be able to deliver any features for for two or three sprints because we've just got to get this done. The Mikado method teaches you to think about doing in-flight changes and doing small changes continuously and also showing your Mikado graph, they call it, to show the team and everyone where you're going with your refactoring. And it means you can bite off little pieces at a time. You don't have to do it all at once. And each time a little piece is done, it's in your production code and it gets deployed. So the, the technique we actually used here was we used a temporary assembly. Um, so we just had an assembly called temp, and that was just mainly so we could shuffle classes around to get references in the right direction. And then everything ended up in the persistence adapter. We did one repository at a time, uh, and then once the repository was done, we removed the references in the containers for those applications, and it became live. So, you know, the, I mean, it took like two or three days to get each sort of repository, each receiver, and each uh, concern done. But, you know, it was continual progress while the team was still doing features, which was nice. You can, you can get a lot of technical debt solved if you can still give your PO features. The next, the next port we tackled was the command port. So the command port was an interesting one. The, the concept of commands is back to control flow, back to where the execution starts. With a lot of them, it's pretty obvious where the execution starts. The web API, for example, the execution starts in the web API. But with the messaging service, it's not quite so clear because we might want to change our queuing message queue service. We might want to switch from Rabbit to you know, in-service bus or something like that. So we'd like to have that abstracted away. But because it's, an, because it's a point of execution, it's not quite as easy to register those things. So we decided to put all of the things that were commands into a command adapter so that command adapter could be concerned with binding it to the infrastructure we chose, which happened to be RabbitMQ in this place. Now, this point, this brings us to an important sort of difference in the ports. You've got this concept of upstream and downstream ports. Um, some people call them primary and secondary if you're um, looking on the internet. But basically the difference is you know, a port is going to serve one of two uses. It's either going to be a point of execution where things start from, or more likely it's going to be a downstream port where your domain calls into. Um, things like publishing a message is a downstream port. Um, you know, you're inter interacting with your database is a downstream port. Uh, upstream ports are generally things like receiving a message off a queue receiving a web API call. The third port that we implemented was notification adapter. Now this also used RabbitMQ, but we didn't put them in the same assembly. The difference being the port, the reasons for them existing were different. One was about pushing messages out to notify, one was about receiving notifications. It's not inconceivable, we might want to use different technologies there. So we created the notification adapter, and we also put RabbitMQ in there. The other thing is, is there's, there's no references in there. Even though there's some common logic, there's copy and pasted code in there, we did not want to have some kind of dry reuse RabbitMQ common class. We just copy and pasted between there, because they're, in, they're implementation details. There's, there's, there's no value in there in coupling to a common implementation. Then we came along and did the cleanup. Once we had that all working, we thought, yep, this is good. Let's remove some of the references. So we deleted that. We just deleted the reference, um, recompiled the project, everything still worked. Everything had been shifted from the domain. So we had this data access assembly now that did nothing. So we got rid of that too. Uh, and then we ended up with a nice clean reference architecture this way. Um, the, the, the nice thing about not going crazy with assemblies, and this is some of the some of the guys in the team were like, oh, why don't we have a DTO assembly and why don't we have an interfaces assembly and, and all this sort of stuff. It's like if you need it, then you know make sure you make sure you prove that you need it before you do it. Because by keeping it simple, by keeping your interfaces in your domain, if you don't need to share them anywhere, everyone referencing the domain, it means it's literally impossible for someone to add a reference going back the other way. Even if you've got a public class in the notification adapter and someone decides they want to use it from the domain, they can't. You're going to get a circular reference, and the compiler won't let you. For those of us, for those of you that have dynamic languages, yeah, hmm. at least static languages, we've got a compiler. Uh, then I can do that, and I can replace my domain with a hexagon. Yep. After that, we can draw in our ports. So if we draw in our persistence port there, 
That's just a namespace, uh, and it's got all of the persistence interfaces in there. There's an I purchase order repository, there's an I supplier repository. We come along and we do the same with the command port, and we do the notification adapter, and things are starting to look very, very tidy now. The, the big difference with some of the um, some of the younger developers on the team was when they actually picked up a feature now, they knew which parts they had to go to straight away to do stuff. There wasn't just one data access assembly with a bunch of namespaces and classes being shared all over the place. It's like if I'm doing a user story that needs a new message and it publishes a message, then I go, you know, I go to the command adapter, I go to the notification adapter, and I do some domain work. Uh, it was very easy for people to get started. So another point. It may, it may have, I think some people probably have realized by now, is that your host is actually another type of adapter. It's kind of a special, adapt a special adapter though. If you think about it, your web API receiving commands is just an adapter. It's just translating calls from you know, a route into your domain. So they're actually kinds of adapters, but the reason they're special is that the, the host adapter, so your command line, your UI, your program, it's allowed to reference everything in general because that's probably where your IOC container is going to be, or at least where you're sort of building your object graph. Uh, so it's going to have to reference everything to put it into the container or to build your object graph. And I've seen people struggle with trying to avoid that and just don't, just do it. Like your web API, is, if you do it right, your web API is going to be so shallow and it's only going to have the concerns about web stuff in there. It's going to have middleware, route checking, authorization, that sort of stuff. And then it's just going to go straight into your domain. Once it's translated, it's going to go straight into your domain. The host ports, if we draw them up there, this is one of those ones that doesn't actually exist. There is no namespace inside a domain called a host port. It's just a conceptual thing. Think of your adapters, think of your hosts as adapters and the port they plug into there. Uh, so the advantages around this architecture, once we had it in place, some of the advantages were, were pretty massive. It was really easy to have domain testability now. Because all of the references in the domain were pointing the right way, it was really easy to build our domain model with no dependencies and test the domain model. It was also really easy to build the web API and actually mock out all of the adapters because the points inside the applications where we wired up the IOC container, we gave ourselves some seams so we could skip the adapter if we wanted to. We could call the host logic saying, hey, wire up a container, but don't put the persistence adapter in there. And then in our integration tests, we would just register the mocks that we wanted in there. The other thing is it gave us really clear boundaries, and this goes back to people knowing where to put stuff, knowing, how, knowing where they should make a change, and it made it really easy for people to find things as well. Then we come into alternative adapters, which is quite nice. So once you've got this way of registering these adapters, it's really easy to switch them out. And you can come up with things like, yeah. So you can come up with things like different adapters for persistence. Now, I've, used, I've actually used ports and adapters for a reasonable amount of time. Uh, in a previous job I worked at an aluminum smelter, and one of the things we had to build was a, an algorithm system for calculating different amounts of fluoride and uh, various different chemical compositions. So we built, we built the, uh, the calculation logic as an engine, and then what we done was when we gave it to the engineers and they wanted to test it, they didn't want to have the overhead of having a database connection and you know, having to clean their data and that sort of stuff. So we literally gave them the algorithms they could test, but we gave them a CSV adapter which meant they could either edit the CSV files to just write in the data they wanted for their test run, then they could run it, and they would find that it would write back out to a command adapter, uh, to a file adapter, so they could check the output. And it was very easy for them to test their algorithms without having to have the database there, and then without having to worry about cleaning up the database. And when you're doing algorithms with a lot of time-based components as well, that can get pretty tricky. So it was really easy in the uh, CSV adapter to allow them to fiddle with time and not actually run with real time. They could pin the date time and say, right, run the algorithm as if the time was now, and these are the values going in. So by able to swap out different, uh, by, able being, being, uh, by being able to write different adapters and swap them out, you unlock a lot of testability. Uh, a recent one that we also had to do, and this is back at Cool Blue now, once we actually done this, we did actually have our PO come up and say, hey, you know what, I'd like actually an email for the guys working in the warehouses of when orders are actually being submitted to suppliers so they know when things are actually on their way. So what we did was we just made an SMTP adapter. 
we added an SMTP adapter. I haven't got it drawn on there for some reason, but we added an SMP adapt SMTP adapter, and then the domain could send out emails. The domain didn't know it was sending emails. It just thought it was notifying. The, S the SMTP stuff actually went in the notification adapter. Yes, we put it in there. So the notification adapter had two infrastructure. It had RabbitMQ and it had SMTP because they're just notifications. Now, what I was going to do was hopefully go through some code examples here. So on GitHub, I've got a repo, which is a, a, an example of ports and adapters. I think it's, it covers a lot of the patterns we've sort of come up with at CoolBlue in terms of implementing this. And the example I used uh, mainly, so I could you know, put up an example and not put up our code, <laughs> was uh, a book ordering service. So a very simple book ordering service. It co focuses mainly on the pattern. So again, this isn't production quality code. Just don't copy and paste this. Don't do a stack overflow on it. Um, I've got big comments in there about you know, some things that, hey, there's no null checking here. There's no verification here. It just tries to show you how to wire these things up. Uh, and it also comes at it from the point of view, I mean, the place where I work, Cool Blue, we're an internal software company. We don't sell our software to anyone. It's just for us. We write our own software for our, you know, for our website. But you might work for someone where you've got different clients and you have to release the same app with different implementations. So this sort of concentrates on how you could have a, a core of business logic and then actually provide two different builds to different clients that have different needs but still have the same business logic. So client one wants a REST endpoint for adding books, approving books, and submitting books. So the general flow is you order some books, someone checks the order and says, yes, that's okay, uh, and then it gets submitted off to the supplier who's gonna send you your books. They want the notification to the supplier to be via SMTP though, and they want to use MySQL as a persistence layer. The second client wants to use RabbitMQ for adding books. They wanna be able to put a message on a queue somewhere and add books that way. They want to use the REST endpoints for approving and submitting, and they want the notification to be via a RabbitMQ message. So they want a message to be put on an exchange somewhere and delivered to the supplier via a queue. Again, this is, this is just a, this, it's not a real world application. This is just to show some different adapters and different technologies being switched out. Uh, if we draw it up uh, with hexagonal architecture, we've got these are the ports. We've got command, notification, persistence, very similar to what we just talked about. Um, we've got some adapters there. We've got a RabbitMQ command adapter a RabbitMQ or an SMTP adapter, and they're split in this case because obviously one client only wants one adapter and the other client wants the other one. Uh, and we've got a MySQL persistence uh, implementation there as well. So, if we switch to some code now. Apologies for those of us in here that aren't .NET, but that's why I asked the question at the start. There's, there's quite a lot of us, which is good. Um, so some of the ways we've got it organized here, if we start off and we look at one of the interesting things here is in the hosts, I've decided I wanted a console host. So it didn't even start off with a web API, I just started off with a console, a console host. And that was because I wanted an easy way to be able to test the application with different adapters in mind. So it's just got some hard-coded values here where I can easily change the different adapters. Um, so there's, you know, I can set the trigger adapter to be a test adapter instead of a real one. I can set the notification adapter to be via email. I can set the persistence adapter to be a test one. Pass in the connection string, that sort of stuff. If we actually see how we build this thing. So we dive in here. We come into the configure part. We register some of our use cases. So use cases, some of the terminology we use uh, in our domain is if you come from some of the other patterns out there, like onion architecture, clean architecture, you see a lot of talk about services and you know, all these things inside your domain layer services. We decided that we would stick to something from Uncle Bob's clean architecture. He calls the, the entry points to your domain use cases and they line up really well with user stories and you think of sort of requirements and that sort of stuff. So we tend to use use case for our public uh, API for our domain. So whatever the host is, it's gonna be calling into a use case somewhere. So we've registered some use cases there. Uh, we dive in here, we configure our persistence adapter, we configure our notification adapter, we configure our trigger adapter, and we configure our host adapter. Now, if we just dump into the persistence adapter here, the way that, we, that we've ended up moving to doing these registrations is originally we would just have the host reach into all the assemblies and go, okay, that interface there, that interface, that implementation. And, and that's valid, it works, but it does make it hard to swap out sort of adapters because you've suddenly got to go change all those registrations, 
for all the classes in your other library as well. So we've ended up sort of flipping our adapters around. And again, this is, this is just mainly because of the software we're building is for ourselves. Um, we don't share a lot of code. We tend to do not, I, w I won't call them microservices. Um, you know, we do appropriately sized services, I think is the new buzzword to use. Uh, and we found it a lot easier for the host just to new up the adapter and pass the container in and say, hey, can you please give me my domain implementations? So we have this concept of initializing an adapter. If there's any work that needs to be done, that'll take care of initializing it. Uh, and then we end up registering and we pass in the container. And it's very simple inside the adapter there. We get to, let's have a look at the MySQL persistence adapter. If we dive in here, all it does is just basically responsible for registering the implementation. So we have an uh, implementation here, MySQL implementation of a book repository, and it just registers it as the interface. What that means is it becomes really easy then to write another adapter, this one here, which does exactly the same thing, except this implementation is just an in-memory dictionary there. So you can literally start the application up, start testing it on the train. You know, if your MySQL database, if you're not lucky enough to have a Docker container with MySQL and your MySQL lives on your network somewhere, you can at least you know, develop on the train with a dictionary, uh, in-memory dictionary there as persistence. So that's a downstream adapter, and they're very easy to wire up because you're basically just saying, you know, I've got all the implementations, here's my interfaces, wire them as that. Let's go and look at a command adapter. Uh, one of the things the test application does is it starts a few threads because the idea of the, uh, the test command line, sort of, we build, the, we build a lot of these tools for our systems now. Um, you know, we do stress testing command lines where we, we take our domain, we uh, write a command application with some parameters to say, hey, you know, send one message every one millisecond or something, and we end up just, you know, writing an adaptive. It's just basically a thread pumping out messages into the domain as quick as it can, mainly to see how the downstream dependencies are affected. So one of these uh, adapters here ends up wiring into the trigger, and it ends up wiring in a use case here. So with the trigger adapter, with the triggers, you've, you've got to give the domain implementation to the trigger because you're telling it the code you want it to run. Obviously, the adapter can't reference the, the domain implementation directly. It just wants to reference the interface and say, hey, I'm going to do this for you. So what you do is you give, it the, you give it the code that you want to run. So we start our trigger adapter up, and we basically say, hey, trigger adapter, I want you to handle this use case. I don't know how you're going to run it. It's just your job to run it. If we look at the RabbitMQ one, What it does, part of the initialize, I mean, RabbitMQ is a good one. I mean, you know, before you can use a, queue, a RabbitMQ, you've got to declare an exchange, you've got to declare a queue, then you want to bind your queue to the exchange. You want to make sure all the stuff is always working. Again, not production code. There's about a million ways you could do that better. Uh, but essentially, when we, part, when we call into handle here, we basically want to wrap that up with a trigger. So we've got, a, we've got our own local implementation, which is actually what handles the concern of binding to the queue, looking for a specific message, and then just calling your delegate that you've passed in there, or your implementation you've passed in there at the moment. And then if we go and look at that use case trigger, uh, when we call start, we just create a connection. We end up binding to the queue and saying, hey, on receive, please call this. And here, we get the message off the queue. We convert it to our, uh, to our domain object, and then we just call execute on the use case. So the adapter is completely in charge of executing the use case. So anytime you want to change to a different queue, the domain doesn't have to know about it. It's the adapter's, you know, the adapter's responsibility. And I think you can see from that that if someone, if you had another user story to support the in-service bus, it would be very easy for someone just to create a new project, a new adapter. They could do all of the in-service bus implementation with integration tests against that assembly, against in-service bus, and then you could just easily switch it over because your domain only cares about the interface. Uh, your host only cares about the interface, sorry. It's just basically saying, give me something that does this, and here's my use case for you to run. Now, the last part I'm going to show you here is if we look in the web service client here. So this is client one. Now, you'll notice again, I haven't been dry here. Like, if I, if I switch between these two classes, they're going to look almost identical. That's the startup for client two. That's the startup for client one. Like, 
it's it's just a shell. It's just a web API client. You, you probably won't have common middleware. You might put those into a NuGet package. Like I mean, we've got some middleware for you know doing API key checking, authorization, that sort of stuff. I mean, we put that into some middleware and we pull it in because it's quite useful. But in terms of the wiring and stuff, you don't really want to share that because it could change at any point. One client might completely change its mind and, and want something different. One client might want to go to .NET Core. Another client might want to stay on you know full framework Owen. Uh, in that case, you just blow one of the clients away and rewrite it to .NET Core and pull the stuff in. Um, ignoring all the pain of the assembly, the other assemblies not being in .NET Core, but .NET Core is a whole new ball game. Um, so in here, we register the persistence adapter, the notification adapter. Now, the one trick that we do when we want to do our integration testing is you see this here? These are registered with virtual. Because what we're basically saying is, in my integration tests, I want to start up my web service, and I want to use the exact startup class that I use in production. So that way, any time anyone changes any registrations, all of my integration tests are immediately affected, and they're immediately testing my real code that I'm going to deploy. But the virtual is there, so in your integration test, you can override that, and you can actually have a testable startup. You can use all of the code apart from the adapters you want to override, because you know you may you probably don't want your integration tests calling out to the network and writing to the database because you're mainly concerned with testing your web service and the domain logic. So by using some virtuals there, that allows you to give you, gives you some seams to get in there and actually change it when you create your uh, subject under test. So all of this is available on GitHub. Um, and I'm going to give the link out after this. Oh. I had to have a slide for that, that's right. Warning, live live code demo ahead. It actually worked quite well. I mean, you know, I've given a couple of live code demos and there's just always something that goes wrong. I mean, this is this is I mean it wasn't really live coding, right? I was just showing you stuff. So, you know. There's some people back uh, at Cool Blue that do do live coding and they're probably gonna call me out on that. They're gonna say, Hey, you didn't do live coding. I'm like, No, I'm not there yet. Small steps, small steps. Uh, what are the takeaways you guys can get from this? So Remember, ports are just a name given to a common group of abstractions. You just group them together uh, based by the name of the port. Uh, the adapters are the specific, specific implementations for a port. So there's something really cool. Uh, Onion architecture, clean architecture, and ports and adapters are really just the same thing. Now, hands up, who's heard of Mark Siemens here? He's a Danish guy, yeah, good, good. So Mark Siemens blog, if you guys have never read it, it's just a treasure trove, like just dive in there, start from like 2010 or 11, whenever he started blogging, but he's got some fantastic posts in there. And I mean, for those of you going down the functional path, I mean, you know, um, we talked about that in the keynote today. I'm not really at that paradigm shift yet for functional, but I think there's a whiskey thing tonight for us speakers, so you know that may just give me the kick I need to do a paradigm shift into functional. But I'm not quite there yet, but Mark Siemens is really big on functional, but he's also really big on dependency injection and all this sort of stuff. But he's got one blog post in particular, uh, and I've got a, got a reference for it on the next slide. But it basically talks about comparing those three architectures in particular, Onion, Clean, and Ports and Adapters, and just showing that if you draw them up and you move them around a bit, they're all the same thing. The main thing is that the dependencies all point inwards towards the application. Uh, there's an example repository on GitHub for .NET if anyone wants to pull it down and just have a quick look because you know, when I first started sort of learning about all this stuff, I mean, I think Onion Architects was the first one that I bumped into. It just got really hard in terms of services and references and you know, where do I start? And so it's just good to have a, a little bit of an example architecture and say, look, this is a real simple case. Just take it and run from there. Uh, and the one thing I can definitely, definitely stand behind uh, and say is that using this architectural style gives you standalone, isolated frameworks. It gives you your business logic there by itself. It gives you adapters that you can test. It's really, really easy to write an integration test against your Oracle persistence adapter because all the stuff in there is for Oracle or against your persistence adapter because you might have Oracle and Raven in there. Really easy. That's the uh, links I was talking about there. There's just a few my email address there at the end. If anyone's got any questions or anything, please feel free to you know drop me an email, um, grab me on LinkedIn. There's a GitHub repository there. I know that all these slides are available on the XP days uh, afterwards, but I will have them on my LinkedIn profile as well. Um, yeah, hopefully 
that has inspired you to go out and use uh, ports and adapters or hexagonal architecture. But you know, from f just going back to what the keynote was about, this really is the architecture that will help you with that testability. Thanks. Thank you.